Now, commandment number one in verse seven, thou shalt have none other gods before me. Now, that, that's kind of the way he is. And how, how could you think he would have it any other way? He is called, he uses the analogy in the book of Isaiah as Ishai, which is husband. Uh, he says, I'm, I'm the husband of my people. Well, uh, a husband doesn't want his wife to put another man before himself. Or, on the other hand, a woman doesn't want a man to put another woman before her. So there's nothing unreasonable about that. I, I use the analogy of flesh to worship. But so he is a jealous God, and he just simply says, don't, I better be number one in your life, and he had better be if you want any blessings from him. Verse uh, 2, then we begin this. That's the first commandment, all right? Now the second commandment. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. In other words, don't be an angel worshiper. Don't be a worshiper of some stick somebody whittles a figurine on. Worship is means that uh, uh, you put a worth uh, ship about the, uh, that's where your worth is. You're drawing worth from it. Well, if it's nothing, then you're kind of worthless, aren't you? Well, that's the way God looks at you if you worship something other than him. He continues with the second commandment. Verse 9. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them. That makes him mad, makes him angry. Nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. It makes me jealous. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, Here's where a lot of people, there's a great deal of misunderstanding. I don't know if people can't read or what the situation is, but it says right there in the Bible that a father's sin is carried on for three or four generations. Now, it didn't say that. It said, I don't care if it went 100 generations. As long as they hate God, they're in trouble. The very first generation that switches the hating of God, distrusting him, doubting him, into believing him, I don't care if it's the first generation, second, third, fourth, or a hundredth, or a thousandth, then instantly that entity is blessed in God's eyes. So... Uh, traditions of men, it's been taught for so long by revolving ribs. It says right there in the second commandment in the book of Deuteronomy that if a father sins, it's going to carry on three or four or five generations. Now, um, over in the great book of Jeremiah, if you've ever studied it, in verse 31, I believe it is, verse 29, what does it say? And... Um, that way it straightens out the dilemma you might have if you've been listening to some yo-yo. Uh, chapter 31, verse 29, the great book of Jeremiah reads, In those days they shall say no more, The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the children don't answer for the father's sin. That's what it means. Period. Now, um, there are extenuating circumstances in such as disease and this sort of thing. Uh, if a father relays a sickly, dis deadly disease onto a child, well, that, that's a little different situation, is it not? But as far as sin against God is concerned, it has none effect on the child in that particular case. So don't let some man mislead you on that. Okay, verse 10. And showing mercy, that's to say love, unto thousands of them that love me 
and keep my commandments. In other words, all they got to do is love me and keep my commandments, and I'm going to give them mercy. I'm going to let them make it. Third commandment, verse 11. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, a lot of people have the idea that that's cussing. That's what it is. That's cussing. No, no, it's, that's it, cussing is bad, but that's not what this is talking about. The word vain, as it is used here, the Hebrew word is a little different than it is used vain or vanity for emptiness. This word is, uh, what is it in the Hebrew? It's sha'a, shala, from sha'a, from shava, which is to say destructive. It is to, um, to um, desolate and to destroy. Are you picking up on it? What are Satan's names, some of them? destroyer, when you see the abomination of desolation, the desolator, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, da Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the desolator being Satan comes in the middle of the week. In other words, calling him Satan, any of Satan's names. Now, if I were to use the same analogy as I used earlier about a husband and a wife, and God does call himself Eshai, your husband, then if I were to use it here, if you really would want to make him jealous, you'd be kind of calling him by, if it would be like a wife calling her husband by her lover's name. <laughs> Boy, you talk about something wanting to set him off or rank him. Now, I insist that you check this out for yourself. All you have to do, you must be very careful, take the word vain as it's used in this fifth chapter and this 11th uh, verse in the great book of Deuteronomy and check it out for yourself. Don't just settle for the word vain as it is used, but take it to its prime, Shava or shav Oh, I've, is it? Yeah, oh. <clears throat> It can be pronounced either way. And check it out. You're getting very nice Satan's names as far as destruction is concerned. Cussing doesn't quite do that, though. Cussing is very unbecoming. And um, it, um, if you ask God to damn the devil, if the devil has bothered you, that's not really cussing or cursing, if you prefer. But if you call our father the destroyer, he doesn't destroy anything. He's a creator, not a destroyer. And he doesn't like it. So don't call him any of the brand marks. And, of course, what, what is the reasoning for this? Naturally, what was Jesus, what were you instructed to call him? Emmanuel, which means what being translated? God with us. God with us. Now, ultimately, Emmanuel will be um, imitated by the destroyer. So on a much deeper level, and this is important, taking the Lord's name in vain, is to call Antichrist the destroyer Lord. Now, that's what he's getting at. On the deeper level, and it doesn't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. I've given you the information that one that can only read English can check out every word I've stated concerning this third commandment of taking the Father's name in vain. Don't you dare call the destroyer Father, which it would mean you had been deceived indeed. And don't cuss either. Verse 12. Now, it's two different things is what I'm saying. Chapter 12, giving us now the fourth commandment. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it. As the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Verse 13, continuing with the fourth commandment. 
Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. 14. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son. And here's a perfect example of, Mos uh, of uh, Moses speaking rather than like a Levitical priest, like a, a father to lay persons, really simplifying it where anyone can understand because he drops part of the commandment and it shows his compassion for all levels of people, though there are none. They're all God's children. Continuing, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. Now, was the Sabbath made for God? Uh, strange, I had the question this past week that it seemed like it was rather a limited thing if God got tired. It wasn't made for him. The Sabbath was made for man. Now, many, time you have, many times you have types and a word to the wise is sufficient. What does Sabbath mean? Naturally, the word Sabbath means rest. Simply rest. Hebrews chapter 4 makes it very clear that Christ had better have be become your rest rather than some day of the week. As well as Colossians chapter 2 stipulates that the Sabbath was nailed to the cross with him. Why? He became our Sabbath. Christ is our Sabbath. Christ is our rest. For there is no other rest in this world. There is no other rest in this earth age. Why, that is where you find peace of mind. And quite frankly, without peace of mind, you have no rest. So many people go uh, to great lengths of legalism and so forth and they fail to pick up on commandments, statutes, and ordinances. And before we finish this chapter, quite frankly, perhaps an oversimplification, but um, God would tell you that you must do his commandments, ordinances, and statutes. One is spiritual, one is moral, and one is civil, meaning law. Many of the ritualistic ones are done away with. They don't exist any longer, such as blood sacrifice. That's a, an ordinance. So you've got to know the difference in those three things, or you're going to have great difficulty in understanding the commandments. It's important because Christ became, for example, Passover. It is written so that a child can understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8, Christ became our Passover. And quite frankly, if you're a Christian, and if you're worshiping any other Passover other than Christ, you're in trouble. You've been deceived. For his cup and his body became his blood and his body became our Passover. And that's important. You're very disarmed, unarmed, unprepared, if you don't understand those things, quite frankly. It's very easy to get tangled up in the old presentation and not keep up with the letter your Father has sent to you and the simple words of Christ in Matthew 5, I came not to destroy the law, not even the sound of one letter, the jot, or the tittle. Greek iota. Not one bit do I change it, but fulfill it. In other words, he became some of the things, and you must keep up with that. He is our rest. Now, it is a way of our fathers counting, though, and as you will find in the Passover messages of this year, we have had 4,000 years B.C. before Christ. We have had two since. That's six. 
when the year 2000 rolls by, you don't want to worry about Y2K. It's, that's, it's nothing. Uh, the people are going to be so disappointed that the sky didn't fall in on January the 1st, 2000. But nothing is going to happen. Why? We don't live by computers. We live by God. All of the computers of man, unless somebody's really slackered, they're all fixed anyway. It's going to be a big disappointment to a lot of people. And you got yo-yos having people run off to the wilderness. But, but what happens on the year 2000? What is a thousand years with God of man's years? One day. Second Peter chapter 3, verse, uh, what is it, 7. I would, Paul's teaching, I would not have you be ignorant about this one thing. A thousand years of man is one day with the Lord. So we became, we, rather than worrying about Y2K, and I don't want you to worry about it, rejoice if you want to, we enter into a sabbatical day of the Lord, which is a period of a thousand years. It is, I'm not saying it is the millennium spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. That could begin whenever. But God would expect, if you read his letter and if you follow him and if you understand the sabbatical law, we, become, we begin a thousand-year sabbatical period. What is seven then, the seventh day? Seven consists of a makeup of four and three. Three is the Godhead in, in um, numerics. Four is man. That's when God communicates with man. So what can we say on these things? You better know what the Sabbath is. It is Christ, and there will be communication begin. Don't worry about Y2K. Look preciously forward to a, um, a new sabbatical thousand-year period. It's going to be interesting, to say the least. Is something going to happen overnight? Not likely. But it will begin the period. It is a benchmark. And for the Christian, that's extremely important. That's what you want to be concerned about. Now, let's go with the, uh, the next verse, 15. Continuing. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm therefore the lord thy god commanded thee to keep the sabbath day and i would say the sabbatical day of the lord is about to begin you'd better keep it how do you keep it letting christ be your pa your sabbath rest resting on him and his word and you better watch watchman i mean really watch let that complete, then, the fourth commandment. Let's now do the fifth chapter. Verse 16 is the fifth commandment of the ten. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, not maybe, not perhaps, hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's the first promise commandment. It's the first commandment that's got a promise in it. Now, if you happen to unfortunately be a child that the parents have, uh, have uh, abused, then uh, you don't uh, honor them for the abuse, but you honor them because they did bring you into this world. They do give you the opportunity to um, be your own person sooner or later. You can honor them from that for that. Because after all, you are important, whether you realize it or not. You're important to God because you're his child. Sometimes he expects someone like that to be a little bigger than anyone else. They can do type, can cut it type people. Where there's a will, there's a way. So thus the fifth commandment. Now, verse 17 gives us the sixth commandment. Thou shall not kill. Now, this is probably one of the saddest things 
of, of, of translations within the King James Bible. The manuscripts are specific. It says, Thou shalt do no murder. We're instructed to kill our enemies if they're overrunning our families. But the word kill, which is to destroy an enemy's flesh body, is not murder. As a matter of fact, I want to call up the Hebrew word on the screen that is utilized here for the word kill. And there you have it. It's ratashk. All right. What does it mean? It's a primitive root properly to dash in pieces to kill a human being, especially to murder, to put to death, kill, and uh, manslay or murder er. There's a great difference in being a murderer is to lie in wait and premeditate taking a life. What's to happen to them? They're to be executed. And an execution is not a murderer. An executor is fulfilling the law. Our Constitution was taken from this Word of God. Our law is very much in, in existence. Jesus himself would say in Matthew, just following the statement I made earlier, about I come not to change the law. He states very clearly as an example. He uses this commandment as an example when he says, You have heard if you kill, you're in danger of perdition, which means to perish, going to hell. Then the word kill, as it is translated in that scripture in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, is this. Is fonius with the prime fonyance, which means criminal homicide, to lie in wait. So Jesus still taught for the murderer, you got a heap of trouble. If you take you take one of God's children's lives, where does that child go? Right straight to the father. And friend, they're waiting on you. The rest of the population is supposed to execute you in one form or the other. The Bible recommends stoning and allowing the, the uh, uh, avenger of the blood to cast the first stone to kill you when you have committed murder. And then when God gets you there, there are no unsolved mysteries with God. And the person you murdered, they're waiting for you, friend. That's why it is written in the first epistle of John, hear my words, first epistle of John, in chapter 3, verse 15, a murder cannot have salvation in their soul. Do you know why? They're a murderer. Now, that does not mean, in my opinion, that a murderer cannot find salvation when they are executed and returned to the Father. It just might be that the person they murdered and the father might forgive them on repentance, so I'd sure do a lot of repenting. But God demands execution for a murderer who we have an absolute double witness, two witnesses that he is a murderer. You can't just go pinning uh, labels on people without a double witness. You've got to have two witnesses but let there be no mistake I, you know you know what happens because people don't study these yo-yos from the cemeteries today and seminaries today they turn them out by the droves and they'll get little candles and go down where a man that absolutely has maybe murdered a 12 year old girl after raping her take candles I mean men of God men of Satan only Satan would go against God's law, saying, we're against capital punishment. Well, go join Satan in his camp. Join a witch coven somewhere. Most witches wouldn't even be that far off from God's word. Just making friends and influencing people here among, among the dear brethren. But I'll tell you what, it really hurts Christianity with ignorance in the brethren that are supposed to be teaching it. Now, you don't have to take my word for what I just said and what I showed you on the screen. Prove me wrong. 
Now, there won't be one taker on that. You know why? Because I'm not wrong. God himself said, if you will execute them and let not any guilt be upon you, let it be on me, others will see and these things will cease happening among you. Even murderers are wise enough to know when we stretch their necks and pop them that even if they're a little bit off, that gets them straight right away. They know better than to do that. That's what God's, why God orders such a thing. Okay, so, be that as it may, verse 18, I know the dear little sugar-coated, over-sweet, sickening, syrupy, sweet Christians that are ignorant of God's Word are saying, Oh, dear God, did you hear what that man said? Well, it's God's Word, and you'd better hear it. It's true. Murders are supposed to be executed. There are no unsolved mysteries, and don't worry, God will take care of it if our people do not. Verse 18, and the wonderful seventh commandment. Neither shalt thou commit adultery. You can take this to however deep you want to. God says don't plow with a mule and an oxen. God says don't uh, uh, wear a suit that is silk and wool. Adultery means many things, as well as um, what most people let adultery totally cover the base of fornication. Well, it's kind of dangerous, but it'll be all right. I don't intend to take it any deeper, but I guarantee you the real truth is, is considerably deeper. 19. 19 is the eighth commandment, and it reads, Neither shalt thou steal. Now, this is one that the dear yo-yo reverends that like to say, well, the law is done away with. Well, thou shalt not steal? That law is done away with in Christ? I don't think so. I think Christ would be very put out at you if you were to steal. Uh, why, why am I saying that? Because I want you to see how ludicrous it is for some yo-yo to say the law is destroyed, the law is good, it's man that's bad. The reason I use that, it's such a simple one. Nobody likes to have anything stolen. Got it? Verse 20 makes the ninth uh, commandment. Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Don't, don't lie about one of your neighbors. And, and you know what? People that practice gossip you know what I heard so-and-so said about my neighbor? Like, you didn't hear it. You, a wise person will not repeat gossip because nine times out of ten is not true in the first place. And then you have, you're bearing false witness and God will get you. Malicious gossip is a very dangerous thing. Be careful. If you haven't heard it out from the horse's mouth, You'd better hear both sides before you make a decision on anything. A wise man never gives counsel until he's heard both sides. I wonder how many times you've heard one side and jump to something real one way and then find out you have to cover all the bases, all right, because you judged a little too quick. All of us are guilty. Be careful. Ten in the final, and we'll conclude with it. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Just If your neighbor is fortunate and God has blessed him, well, praise God, be happy for him. Don't be envious. Don't... Don't uh, covet anything he has. Take it from him. Wish you had it. Take it without, you know. It, um, that's what a, a, a neighbor is the most valuable person to you outside of family in the world. Because Why? When you go on vacation, you don't have to hire a security company if you've got a good neighbor. I've always been blessed. I've, I've always had wonderful neighbors. God really blessed me that way whereby when they went on vacation or were sick or something, 
I would guard their property with my life. And vice versa, if I had to go somewhere or something, they guard my property even to this day, basically with their lives. If it takes it, uh, they'll, you know, um, I won't say any more than that. But uh, they have, usually I have very good friends, uh, Smith and Wesson. They're, they're good buddies to have, you know. And the, uh, so enough said. A neighbor is a precious person. If you need help instantly, they're there, you know, in an emergency. That's good neighbors. And I can't help but think like people that move around the country and they'll say, well, how are the neighbors around here? Well, what were the neighbors like where you came from? Now, they were stuck up and they wouldn't have anything to do with me. Well, you're going to find them here a whole lot the same way. So, and that's the way it is because you make good neighbors. It's, you be good to them, and I guarantee you a neighbor, most often, there are exceptions to every rule, but they most likely will all. Anyway, I'm out of time.